As we get going this morning, I want to do a little housekeeping and just to appreciate, uh, number one, Dalton preaching on my behalf last week while I was gone and out of town. He always does a great job. It's, it's a lot of fun with our staff as young men in ministry to kind of get to encourage and cheerlead. And, and so I'm proud of Dalton and the work that he's doing and appreciate that. Then also just to say thank you to the men who showed up. I mean, we, we didn't blow away, right? We're all here, but man, oh man, that was just some crazy winds. And anytime you have 30 foot pines, it's that kind of wrap around your property, you can almost guarantee you the wind's going to knock a few of those things down. And so I think there was a few pictures somebody sent me yesterday, the families that were out here cleaning up trees, the Eads family was uh, brought their kids and appreciate Danny, uh, Matt Simpson and his kids, and then also Jeff Blanks and all of them brought their kids. It's kind of a, it's, it's a great way to teach our kids to work and also for the Lord. And uh, the truth is, if they didn't do it, who would, right? So appreciate them uh, cleaning up our property this morning or last night yesterday, whenever that was. I slept since then, Danny. <laughs> but I appreciate them. Then also, I just want to call your attention to a few things that are coming up that are important. You know, there's so much in the life of the church, and we just don't want you to miss opportunities. We actually have one of our men's breakfast coming up, and so that's March 18th. If you jot that down, of course, all this information's on our website. You can go to our events tab. But we have Bill Reeser is actually going to be with us. If you don't know Bill, he's at Church of the Savior. I think he used to be at Southland, then went out west and came back. He's got quite the story. But back in the day when he was young and ready for college, he was listed as one of the top street ball players in all of America. He came from the inner cities of Harlem, and he grew up in New York City, and so he has some crazy stories. I just basically said, Bill, it's March Madness. I know it's hard to believe. I said, but come bring us some of your basketball stories, some of your personal life stories, and uh, if, you, if you've never met Bill, you're in for a treat. But men, we need you to sign up so we know how much food to buy, and uh, we can only get about 90 max in that uh, multi-purpose room, and we have been maxing that on occasion, so it's important that we know that you're coming so we know how to prepare. To hear Bill speak, this is actually one of those, you, you want to bring a buddy. Do not come alone, drag one of your buddies with you. His story and testimony are just unbelievable. So uh, we're excited about that. That's March 18th at 8 a.m. And then something we've not done since I've been here, but I think it's equally as important. Um, we have a legacy planning meeting on March the 21st. And maybe you don't even know what this is. So let me just kind of walk you through a little bit of this. <clears throat> I think everyone can agree that it is important to have a plan for your savings, for your estate, for your, you know, for your kids and your grandkids to save you some time and money, save your kids a little heartache is if we would have a plan, you know, before we go see the Lord, let's get our act together. And so we cannot predict the future, but we can plan for it. Amen, church? This workshop is to help you plan for that, okay? We want you to, to make sure that your desires and your wishes are accomplished and carried out, that you have all your medical decisions are predetermined and, and, and laid out, uh, guardianship for your children. You know, all of these things are so important. The things that you value, that they get distributed the right way. You don't know how many times as a minister that I have seen family feuds over all this business, and it's just stuff, Right? But we need to have a plan for this stuff. And so on the 21st, uh, I, I pray that you would join us. I'm going to be here for this. I've got things that I'm interested in. As Now as I'm a grandpa, you know, I want to make sure everything, ducks are in order. And I want to take care of my family. So please, on the 21st, register so we know that you're coming. And I look forward to that. It's hosted by Christian Financial Resources. And so you can actually go to their website and learn more about that. And it's on our website, of course. Then the last thing I want to mention, and I'll pray over our, our uh, study today, but fathers in the field, we talk about it every now and then, but we especially right now are leaning in, praying for men in our church that would give of their time and energy to mentor young men in our community who have no father. So we take kids from the age of seven through the age of 17, and if we identify them in our community or through our schools or through our church, when we find a young man like that, we have and want to have men who will mentor these young men. There's zero father in the home. 
And we want to come alongside and encourage and bless these men. So much grief and trauma and tragedy are the result of young men growing up without a dad, without a father, without a grandpa, without some man speaking into his life. And so this program is called Fathers in the Field. Very important to our community. It's life-changing for these young men. So if you're interested, we will train you, we will equip you, we will give you the resources, we'll coach you through what does it look like to come alongside some of these young men. But uh, George and Patty Gilpin are our church champions, and of course this is on our website, and you can call the church and say, hey, I want to know more about this mentoring of the young men, fathers in the field. So uh, pray over that. We already have a couple of young men in our uh, community that we are mentoring. Uh, Aaron Perkins and Matt Simpson are both fathers, mentor fathers, uh, but we need to multiply that. We need to have men ready and prepared uh, for the, the opportunities. So pray over that and think about that, and uh, I'll pray over our morning as we continue to worship. Father, there is a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of things going on in our life, in our world, in our church, in our home. We just kind of survived this crazy windstorm, and that's made things a mess. It's taken extra time and energy. And Lord, sometimes I believe Satan, his greatest weapon against us is just keep us busy. Just keep us busy. Even doing good things, just keep us busy. And so, Lord, I'm praying right now for every family here that we would create margin in our lives, room for you to work, room for you to grow, room for you to challenge us. Lord, uh, we we want to be a a part of what you're doing, and uh, what a privilege that is, Lord. And so just help us with wisdom, uh, Holy Spirit discernment. Help us to know, Lord, uh, what you're asking of us, because we want to join you in whatever it is, Lord that you're doing. I thank you for Jessamine Christian Church, its ministry, the mission that we have, Lord, and just pray a blessing and protective hedge around our church today as we study from your word. We thank you for Jesus and his teachings, and help us, Lord, to follow in his footsteps closely. Pray all this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever preached, Jesus starts with eight principles, and we call those the Beatitudes. So you can look at Matthew chapter 5, but I also want to encourage you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 31 and 32, because as we talk about this hunger and thirst for right living that Dalton and David referred to, I actually want to take an Old Testament story, and I want to illustrate through the life of Jacob, Jacob what does it look like to hunger and thirst? for right living. And we see that in his life. Uh, Maybe if you've never studied his life, uh, there'll be some aha moments for you. Uh, I pray and trust. But Jesus is speaking and he says, blessed are those, blessed means happy, but if you take it to a more literal, it means more than happy or it means supremely happy, right? You know, the world's choosing, uh, pursuing happiness, right? But God says, I can give you something even better than happy. I can more than happy, supremely blessed. God blesses those who are poor in spirit, for they realize they need him. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they shall inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who, there it is, who what? Who Hunger and thirst for justice or righteousness, depends on what translation you're reading, for they will be satisfied. Today we're going to look at the fourth beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for right living. Of course, we already know this is a spiritual hunger. If we're talking about physical hunger, that's another sermon. It's in the seven deadly sins, and it's called gluttony. And I got that one in the bag if we want to talk about physical hunger, but I'm letting everybody off the hook because I cooked a 10-pound prime rib yesterday, so we don't want to talk about gluttony. We're talking about a spiritual hunger here as it's illustrated in the life of Jacob. His story illustrates. In fact, it really illustrates all of the Beatitudes up to this point in time. These, these are not just steps. These are not just principles that we've made up to help you have a better life. No, these principles, these Beatitudes, they're actually found all throughout the Scriptures, as David illustrated, even in the Old Testament we see these principles. And so please know that they're not just what we're talking about. It's just not found in the Sermon on the Mount. No. 
You find them all the way through. Uh, we talk about this road, this path, this journey we're on, a road to healing or a road for spiritual growth and growing our faith or the road to a fullness or an abundant life or the road to recovery from those hurts, those habits, those hangups, right? That it's the path to becoming all that God wants you to be. All the blessings that God wants to pour out into your family. The Lord wants to bless you supremely. He wants you to have a blessed life. And so let's, let's look, if you're in Genesis 31 and 32, I can't read the whole story. I'm going to paraphrase some of it. I definitely encourage you, please this week, as some homework, go read the life of Jacob. It is a wild story. I want to look at specifically in, in Jacob's life the phases of his life that God uses to bring about change in his life. Ultimately, folks, what we celebrate at Jessamine Christian Church, you want to know what we call the win? It's life change. Someone comes and confesses publicly they believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God. They're united with Christ in a watery grave of baptism. We celebrate that, don't we? Because it speaks to a new life, a new birth, a new identity. And so that's what we want to celebrate, this, this idea of life change. And we see this in Jacob's life. So right now, what I want to do is just kind of give a review. If you're a guest of ours today, maybe you missed a couple of sermons on the lane. We're on number four of eight. But let's, let's do a little review so you don't miss the big picture of what's happening behind the scenes in the Beatitudes. Are you with me? All right. Number one, if you want to take some notes here about how, to, how does God bring about change in your life, this first phase is called conflict. Conflict. Jot that down. Here's some notes about conflict. Because I believe many times over when God wants to do something in your life, it starts with conflict. It starts with struggle. And guess what? It's usually with other people around you, right? Have you been knocking heads with anybody for a while? Huh? You, you got some conflict or struggle? It's almost always with other people. Did you know that God uses those struggles with the other people because he wants to get your attention? The conflicts that you're having, those are there, and God wants to use them to get your attention. And that's how it works. When, when God wants to bring about a change in your life, it always starts with conflict. Let me give you a little background. If you don't know Jacob's story, this is it kind of in a nutshell. But Jacob's entire life can be summed up with actually this first phase of conflict. His whole life was about conflict. This guy came out of the womb in conflict with his twin brother. When he was born, Esau came first, and Jacob wanted that position. And the scripture says that Jacob literally was hanging on to Esau by the foot. He's, he wanted that first position. It wasn't his to have, but he was hanging on for dear life. Esau was born first. When Esau came out of the womb, Jacob holding his ankle, they actually named Jacob. They gave him his birth name, which literally means hanging on. It also means deceiver or cheater. You know, he was trying to cheat Esau out of that firstborn uh, inheritance, ultimately. And so um, he wanted to be first. That wasn't his role. They called him Jacob, means hanging on. And from that point, with Jacob and Esau, they fought in some of the most unusual ways. In fact, Jacob later on in life does steal Esau's inheritance from him. Can't tell the story? Go read it this week. But he does accomplish what he set out to do because he was, he was a deceiver, a liar, a cheater. And so now the rest of Jacob's life, he is estranged from his brother. Now, as you're studying the life of Jacob you are going to see that Jacob is always running from conflict. Conflict with his brother, check. Conflict with his wife, check. Conflict with his father-in-law, absolutely. Conflict with his brother-in-laws. Ultimately, conflict with God. That he's having conflicts everywhere, and all the way through the life of Jacob, you see God trying to get his attention through those conflicts. And so when you pick up the story in chapter 31 and chapter 32, Jacob is finally between a rock and a hard place as a young man. His father-in-law he has conflict with, and 
Another story you got to read. Back then, he was willing to work. He wanted to marry this young lady. He said, I'll work for you, father-in-law, for seven years if you let me marry your daughter. He goes to marry her to lift the veil only to find out that Laban, the father-in-law, has deceived Jacob. He worked for seven years and he married the wrong sister. He got the ugly sister. (laughs) Jacob says, okay, Laban. I will work another seven years for the right. And so here we are. He's married now. He's got Leah. He's got Rachel. He's at conflict with his father-in-law, Laban. And as they're going, the father-in-law is pursuing because when he finally got the daughters, he split town. And uh, so his father-in-law is pursuing him. His brother, who's always been estranged, has 400 men and they're chasing him. Jacob, at this point in the story, is caught between a rock and a hard place. And that's the first stage here, is understanding conflict. Jacob is at a point where reality is going to come knocking. This is the reality check for Jacob. And we have to get there. At some point in time, we have to realize reality. We have to realize, hey, I'm not God. I have to admit that I am powerless to control my tendencies to do the wrong thing. And my life, apart from the Lord, is unmanageable. Anybody ever been there? That's exactly where Jacob is at in the story. That's his first phase. And until you get this stage of life, nothing changes. You want to change? It doesn't change till you get to a place that it is so painful that it promotes change. That's why you have to have conflict. Conflict then moves to the next phase. And this happens if we want to grow our faith. Stage two, Jacob, like I said... He's between father-in-law and brothers. He sends his family and all of his values and possessions ahead of him. And he spends the night alone. Jacob, knowing that his father-in-law and brother-in-law are pursuing him, he sends everybody ahead. He's camping at a little brook named Jabbok. And while he's there, he gets into a fight that night. But it's not just any fight. It's not just any wrestling match. It's very unusual in that he is wrestling with God. This is where it gets pretty interesting in the story. I mean, this is like the WWF wrestling of all times, right? Him and God are having it out. And so that's the second phase I'm referring to. It's from conflict to crisis, The crisis is always going to be a struggle with God. Conflict is with other people. Crisis ultimately needs to come from God. Now, I'm not just saying conflict with other people, but it is a wrestling match with God. If you've ever related to any of these phases of conflict and crisis, then welcome to the human race. I mean, we have to get to a place that we're willing to struggle with God. Chapter chapter 32. Jacob gets his family ahead, safely across the Jabbok, along with all his possessions. But Jacob stayed behind, and he is left alone in camp. And a man came and wrestled with him till dawn. Okay, so this is a long wrestling match that that he's wrestling all night. Have you ever been there? Have you ever wrestled with God all night long? Have you ever had a sleepless night where your mind, it just won't slow down? It's going a mile a minute, and you and the Lord are duking it out all night long. Have you ever been there? And that's where Jacob is. Now, what's going on here? Folks, the biggest conflict that he had was not really with his father-in-law. The biggest conflict that he had was really not with his brother or his wife or anyone. Folks, the reality is the biggest struggle was his crisis with God, which, by the way, is also your biggest crisis, right? Also for you. It's true for all of us. He's been running from God all his life. God says, okay, I've got you where I need you. You're between this rock and a hard place. Let's have it out. Let's wrestle it out. Let's fight it out right now, right here. And all night long, that's what they did. Now, make the parallel here with me, please. Don't miss the point here. You know the problems that you're having in your life right now. And none of us are exempt. Every one of us. We all have some baggage we probably drug through the door today. The crisis that you're in right now. The conflict that you're having. The difficulty that you're trying to get through. Folks, that ain't the real problem. The problem is not 
what's going on with your kids. The problem is not what's going on with your husband. The problem is not with your wife. The problem is not with your friends. The problem is not with your finances. The problem is not with your health. Those are symptoms that the real struggle ultimately is with you and God. That's the reality. And it's who is going to be God in your life. Does God have the right to tell you what to do? Does God have the right to call the shots in your life? Will you trust him? Whatever the struggle, the conflict, the crisis, whatever it is that we're talking, the baggage that you drug, will you trust God in it? That's ultimately the challenge. That's why you have to move from phase one conflict to the crisis and the struggle with God. You've got to get to the point of realizing that God is God and that you're not, and you have to admit that. What is my struggle with God? What is your struggle with God? The root of all your conflicts in this life is that you want to be in charge. That's what it all boils down to. We like to be in charge. We want to be God. It's definitely a control thing. And Jacob had it. And guess what? So do you. So do we. Right? You want to call the shots in your life. Absolutely. You want to run your life. You want to make your life the way you want to make it. It's your plans. It's your agendas. It's your way. And that's the root of all the problems. At the end of the day, we like to be in control. And so we have to struggle this out with God. It's, a, it's when do we get to the place of surrender? That's what we need to ask ourselves. When are you willing to just surrender? Because that's what prepares us each of these phases. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. At some point in time, there's got to be a godly sorrow for the sin. We have to earnestly believe that God exists. That we actually matter to God. Do you understand? Do you know that you matter to Him? And He's the one who has the power to help you change. As long as you're trying to bring about change in your own self and in your own flesh and in your own way, well, it's no wonder we make a mess out of it. Because guess what? At the end of the day, we don't have the power God does. And so we're looking at these phases. How can God bring about change in your life? There has to be conflict with others. There has to be a struggle and crisis with God. Number three, if you're a note taker here, write this down. At some point in time, you have to commit to the process. You have to commit to this. In, in phase three, you got to finally cry uncle, right? you got to give up and you got to surrender. I'm going to commit to the changes that God wants to make in my life. I'm going to hang on, I'm going to hold on, and I'm not going to give up. And I'm going to go with God wherever he takes me. Even if it kills me, I'm going with him. I'm committed to this process. And God, I'm going your way because I want you to bring about change in my life. God, I want you to bless my life. Now, if you're in the text with me, look back at verse 26. This very unusual wrestling, wrestling match between God and man. In verse 26, it says, And then the man, and that's talking about God, And then the man said, Let me go, for it's dawn. You know, they've been wrestling all night long. Jacob's a little winded. He's panting. He's out of breath. And Jacob says, I won't let go unless you bless me. Folks, that's commitment. Ah, uh-uh, I ain't letting go. Till I, came, till I get what I came for. I came for a blessing. I ain't letting go. Folks, this is the commitment that we need. God, I'm serious about the change. God, I want your blessings in my life. You've got to help me, God. I cannot do it on my own, and I ain't letting go until you bless me. That's commitment. Jacob is moving through these phases uh, and this commitment choice. We have to consciously choose to commit all of my life, all of my will into Christ's care and control. We choose that. In fact, I don't know that God's blessings really flow until we get to a place of commitment. That nothing's going to happen in your life until you get to this phase. You've got conflict. You've got crisis. At what point do you surrender and say, okay, God, I, I surrender. You're it, God. I'm committing myself to you. And if I could give you a little advice this morning. If you're serious about letting God change your life, this commitment phase, folks, you've got to hang on. You've got to hang on with all you've got. You've got to hold on and you don't give up until God blesses you. 
And you don't just say, Lord, save my marriage. You pray about it once and then you walk away and you give up. That's not how that works. So many people, in fact, I think most people, are missing God's blessings and missing God's best in your life because we give up way too soon. And that's not what I see here. We don't make it till dawn. We get tired in the middle of the night and we want to quit. And we give up in the struggle. Forget it. It's not worth the time. It's not worth the energy. Just forget it. I'm giving up on this dream. I'm giving up on this relationship. I'm giving up on this challenge. Hey, I'd never be able to change anyway. You ever said that about yourself? You ever said that about others? Ah, they'll never change. Well, we won't, folks, if we're not committed to accepting what God wants to do in our life. That brings about change. Don't do that. Don't quit. Don't give up. We stay with this phase here, this commitment phase. I'm committing for God to change me, and I'm not going to let go until he does. I'm not going to let go until he blesses. That leads to the fourth phase. If you're jotting this down, there's the conflict with others. There's the crisis with God. You know, we realize ultimately we're the problem, not our people around us. We're actually the problem. And that's the fourth phase is this confession phase. Hey, Lord, I admit ultimately it's me. It's not my husband. It's not my friends. It's not my mom. It's not my dad. It's not my kids. It's not the people that I work for and work with. No, Lord, I admit, I'm confessing, I am the problem. I am my own worst enemy. I am the biggest problem. Folks, do you realize the breakthrough, what is accomplished in the power of confession? That it's this confession phase when I admit, and I openly confess, and I examine my own life and my own faults and my own sin and my own shortcomings? This is a major breakthrough, and we see this in Jacob's life. He's wrestling with God. And the scripture says, and then the man, remember that's God, and then the man asked him, what is your name? What is your name? Jacob, he answers. I think that's really an unusual request, right? Isn't that a strange question? They've been wrestling all night. It's the middle of the night. God obviously knows Jacob's name, and yet God says, hey, what is your name? Folks, do you know why he asked the question? Because ultimately, the reason God's asking is he wants Jacob to admit who he was. This confession stage. He's asking it because he wants Jacob to hear it out loud. You know, in the ancient times, they gave names with purpose. It's not like how we name our kids and grandkids today. Where y'all come up with some of these names for y'all's kids and grandkids? It's killing me, man. I was like, can you spell that? Is that that in English? What is this? I don't know. And you all know people like that. And they name their children like bizarre names. But back in ancient times, names were with purpose. Like I am a... Baker. My name is Baker. Guess what his dad's occupation was? He was a baker. Yeah, makes perfect sense. I am a carpenter. I am a smith. My dad was a blacksmith. Sometimes you'd be named after people in your family or relatives. My name's Johnson or my name's Jackson or things like that. Maybe it was named after a situation that happened in your life. Names had purpose back then. And so we know that Jacob's name means deceiver. And, and he lived up to his name. If you know Jacob, his entire life, he lied out of one situation. He lied right back into another one. One conflict after another conflict. One deception after another. He was a manipulator. So folks, in the story, when God says, what is your name? He's saying, Jacob, I want you to own up and admit who you are. And it makes me wonder, and ask yourself, if you were named after your biggest character flaw, what would they name you? What would your name be? Hi, my name is Bitter. My name is Gossip. My name is, it's all about me. My name is Angry Temper. If you were named after your biggest character flaw, what would people say? Oh, there goes Greedy. Here comes fearful. Aren't you glad we don't do that anymore? 
point in all of this is, if you want change to happen in your life, it starts with humility. That was last week's message. It starts with humility. It starts with a brokenness. It, it starts with being honest about who you are. And when I stop making excuses, and when I stop blaming, and I stop justifying, and stop rationalizing, and when I come before God and I'm just honest about it, and I'm honest with myself, and I'm honest with other people, that is the symptom of brokenness. And when I just am willing to say, God, I admit it. Some of y'all are making this way too hard. <laughs> you just got to get to, uh, God, I admit it. I am the problem. You want God's blessings in your life? You want to be more than happy? Just own it. Look at how God responds out throughout the scripture when we admit our brokenness. The Bible says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. You ever been there? He comforts those who mourn. That's why we actually eventually get to phase five in our lives. Here's phase five if you're jotting these things down. When you get to this place of humility, admitting you're a broken sinner who needs a Savior, guess what? We get a Savior. The, the fifth phase in the conversion is we get a new name. We get a new identity. We're new creatures in Christ. God picks up all the pieces and He replaces the pieces with peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. So if you're tracking with me here, you're moving from the phase of conflict with others to a crisis with God. You make a commitment, I'm, I'm going to change with God's help, right? I'm not letting go till you bless me. And then you confess that you have a problem and that you are the problem. Last one here is the conversion. We actually see life change at this point. We get a new name and a new identity. I love God's response to Jacob's brokenness and his confession. Verse, uh, chapter 32, look back at the text there. It actually is the reason that we're using the fourth beatitude here. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob. I'm changing it. There's a conversion, a life change, a transformation. Of him. Your new name will be Israel. If you've been around the church for a while, if you read your Bible, do you know the significance of the name Israel? Right? As in the nation of Israel. Have you ever heard that? This is the guy, the liar, the cheater, the crook, the deceiver. Your new name will no, your name will no longer be Jacob. Your new name is going to be Israel. At this time, Jacob had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. The scripture says, and then he blessed him there. Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God's face. I saw God face to face there. You talk about life change? You go from the deceiver and the liar and the cheat and the crook to the whole history of Israel and all of the Jewish people are named after you, Israel. Your 12 boys are the 12 tribes of Israel. That is a life change that only God can do. And I was blessed. I saw God face to face. What happens in this phase of your life when you get to the conversion phase, this is what we would also call the recovery stage. When you start following up in these beatitudes, step by step, the healing choices, step by step, we've seen them outlined in Jacob's life. And, and Jacob gets a new identity. He says, God, I've been a manipulator, a schemer, a cheater. My name is Crook. But because God blessed him, I got a new name. My name's Israel. And do you know what the name Israel means? It means Prince of God. You got a new name. Prince of God. Princess of God. And he did that. God was always changing names. Remember Simon in the New Testament? He said, you're not Simon any longer. Now you're Cephas, which means rock, Peter. And upon the confession of your faith, I will build my church. And he changed Peter's name. It was Simon. It was Saul, and he changed his name to Paul. It was Gideon, and he changed his name. 
It was sons of thunder, and now I call you my beloved brothers and disciples. Folks, he was changing the names of people all throughout history and all throughout Scripture, and he's giving them a new name, and he's giving them a new identity. And folks, he wants to bless you with a new name and a new identity. You're not going to be Jacob anymore. You're going to be Prince. You're going to be Princess. And Jacob gets that new name. The scripture in the New Testament says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is past. The new has come. Amen? Aren't you thankful you can let go of that old past and you can have a new? The scripture says, And God blessed him. You get blessed. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I am not letting go, Lord, till you bless me what Jacob did and he didn't let go and he didn't settle for second best and he wanted God's blessing and God gave it folks this is a transformation step voluntarily submitting to every change that God wants to make in you and in your life and aren't you so thankful that you are not the man you used to be I am not the man that I used to be I thank God that I'm not who I'm going to yet be because guess what God's not done with Lee Faust yet Can you say that? Aren't you glad you're not the man? Wives, aren't you glad he's not the same man? Aren't you glad he's not the man he's going to be yet because God's not done? And he's still working. we got to hang on. And we got to receive God's blessing. And Father, I ask that now as we bow our heads in prayer. Let me ask some questions because we need to be wrestling with you, Lord. And so with every head bowed and every eye eyes closed, I'm going to ask some questions. Question. Are you here today and you're experiencing conflict right now? Is it possible that God's trying to get your attention? Questions. In what area are you struggling with God? You know the right thing to do, but you just keep ignoring it. You keep fighting with God over it, and you're afraid to trust Him. And can I just say, friends, there is no way you're going to win that battle. That you need to give God control in your life. That you go to the mat with God over this. Questions. Are you here today and you feel like giving up? And I pray that you hear me as your pastor, as your friend who loves you, hold on. Do not give up. Do not quit. Do not give in. And you say to God, I'm not letting go till you bless me. And I'm asking, when will you face that reality? When are you going to face the truth about you? Stop blaming other people for the problems that you've caused. When are you going to stop pretending that you're not the problem? When are you going to share that struggle with a friend? Questions, Lord. Ultimately, Lord, the question we ask, when will we let Christ give us a new name, a new identity? Underneath every Jacob, Lord, we know that you see a prince. You see a princess. That you see. Yes, I know that we've been Jacobs. But Lord, we want to be Israel. Dear God, I'm just asking that we would admit the struggle, the fight, that it's real. The conflicts and the stress in our life. Today, Lord, I pray that we would commit ourselves to Jesus Christ 100%. That we would open our life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That we'd give it to you. Father, we pray that Jesus Christ would come through your spirit and overtake our life right now. In every area of our life, you would just take over and we would give you that control. Even if it means we walk with a limp the rest of our life, Lord, that we, Lord, will glory in our weakness, in our limp, because it shows how great you are. And Lord, even this morning in this sanctuary, this holy ground that we stand on, We invite you to be a part of our lives. We humbly admit we need you and we cannot do it on our own. 
So this morning, as we have a song of decision, I just pray for boldness and courage for whoever's here today that's ready to quit and give up, that they would come forward and receive prayer and support and encouragement or just a quietness on their knees before your cross, Lord, at your feet, Lord. That if there are people here and they want that new name, they want to be united with Christ, confessing their faith, Lord, in a watery grave of baptism, we pray that they'd be willing to humbly before their family and friends confess that they believe that you are Christ, the Son of the living God, that they would accept you today as their personal Lord and Savior. Oh, I pray that might happen. For those of us, Lord, that have been following you a long time, maybe we've strayed from the past. Maybe we've ignored you for a while. Maybe we bought into the lies that we think that we are in control and we're not. And Lord, I pray this morning might be a time of rededicating ourselves to following closely to the footsteps of Jesus. Oh, I pray we'd be covered by the dust of a rabbi. That we want to be and our attitude to be the same as that of Christ. This morning, Lord, whatever decision needs to be made, whatever you laid on the heart, Lord, I just pray for boldness and action. Not just hearing the word, but doers. And I pray that in this time of decision. In Jesus' name I pray.